Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining RS's monthly complimentary webinar, Black Swans Incidents Happen. The power of preparedness and partnerships for the Fukushima NPP March 2011 response with Dr. Norman Coleman. Please look forward to our upcoming webinars, Don't Be a Fool, How to Write a Grant from a Reviewer's Perspective, with Dr. David Yu, Dr. Ashley Golden, and Dr. Nicole Simone on April 1st, April Fool's Day, and Chernobyl 35 Years After with Dr. Ala Shapiro on April 23rd. Moderating for us today, we have Dr. Mark S. Mendonca. Dr. Mendonca is a professor of radiation oncology and medical and molecular genetics and director of radiation and cancer biology at Indiana University School of Medicine. He has extensive expertise in both X-ray and proton radiation biology. Dr. Mendonca's research is focused on increasing the effectiveness of radiation in lung and pancreatic cancer treatment by biochemical and genetic mechanisms, as well as physical approaches, protons, nanoparticles, and flash. Since 2011, Dr. Mendonca has served as the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Radiation Research. In April of 2020, Dr. Mendonca was appointed Associate Vice Chancellor of Research for IUPUI. And with that, I'll hand it over to Mark to introduce Dr. Norman Coleman. Thank you, Cassandra. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Norm Coleman. Dr. Coleman is Associate Director for Radiation Research Program and a Senior Investigator in the Radiation Oncology Branch at the Center for Cancer Research at the NCI and NIH. He's also the Senior Medical Advisor and member of the Chemical, Biological, and Radiological Nuclear and Explosive Team in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response at the Department of Health and Human Services. He also serves as co-chair of the Radiological Nuclear Working Group for the Global Health Security Initiative under the Office of Global Affairs. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Coleman today, and I look forward to his lecture on Black Swan's incidents happen, the power of preparedness and partnership. Thanks, Noam, please. Well, um, I really thank the uh, Radiation Research Society for the opportunity to give this presentation. It's 10 years ago, last week, to the beginning of the multiple disaster that involved the Fukushima nuclear power plant. And it's uh, with great respect that I, I give this presentation today. It was a, a very daunting and touching experience to be involved in Japan during this incident. So you've heard who I am. A disclaimer is this is a personal opinion of the presenter. This does not represent opinion, policy of the NCI, NIH, Department of Health and Human Services, or the Radiation Research Society. So acknowledgments are in order. The professional and heroic response of the Japanese people in the face of this multiple disaster is a remarkable example of working diligently and effectively. There are many people far more expert than I who have worked on understanding the incident and conducting health and medical and epidemiologic follow-up. This includes colleagues in the Fukushima University, international agencies such as IA, EA, WHO, and others. What was accomplished and learned from this incident was the result of extraordinary efforts from many colleagues in US, Japan, and global partnerships. So a problem to consider is, how does one prepare for a black swan incident? Well, a black swan incident is a rare, unpredictable event with serious and unavoidable effects. So I will present four aspects of this. The first is preparedness for disasters, how the US nuclear radiologic preparedness effort came into being. Next is what happened after March 11, 2011. The incident unfolded and required expertise to work within the US Embassy in Tokyo. The experience in helping Ambassador John Roos manage the incident in partnership with the host country will be described. Lastly, uh, lessons learned specifically related to our mission will be presented. There is much done by other experts and agencies and I am very grateful to them for their contributions. So all this began 10 years ago um, before the Fukushima incident. After 9-11, the US began to realize we had not done sufficient preparation for terrorist events. In fact, for nuclear incidents, there had been very little done since the Cold War, probably 30 years before that. So there were 50 national planning scenarios that were established that we prepared for. Number one was a nuclear detonation, which is a 10 kiloton improvised nuclear device 
and number 11 was a radiologic attack, radiological dispersal device. And what was interesting that nuclear detonation being first, we felt it was somewhat appropriate because if you can prepare for something as, as explosive and as disastrous as a 10 kiloton nuclear device, you could subsume preparation for other sorts of disasters. So a big effort was put into preparing for nuclear detonation. So the first work really began in December 2001 when the radiation research experts, including Radiation Research Society and a number of others got together in NIH to talk about what do we know regarding radiation injury that we could possibly do were there to be a nuclear incident. And the main efforts we had were in medical management and radiation injury. So we began to define the problems we were going to have to solve. Acute radiation syndrome was known and the concept of delayed effect of acute radiation exposure or DEER was created because um, in response terms, often things that happen up to 30 days is considered acute and after that is considered chronic. But the fact that one can get exposure on day one and not have adverse effects until weeks or months later was a new concept for preparedness. We learned from the science that there's a continuum of injuries and that it is indeed multi-organ injury. What was important is that there's time between exposure and clinical manifestation, and that depends on the organ system and dose. So the phases are prodromal, a latent phase, and a manifest phase. And for hematologic injury, there can be a gap between a few days and up to weeks or months between the initial exposure and there being manifest injury. So the fact there is a very large scale injury happening suddenly, it was mitigated to some extent that there is time to begin to do interventions. And uh, the radiation research community began to focus on how one can diagnose and how one can treat these different manifestations. So what next to, uh, had to be set up was, how does one respond to this? So the emergency response community is really very good at responding to disasters, but what was particularly different here was the presence of radiation. And there is an inherent radiophobia, which we understood. So we had to create a response system that was specific for radiation incidents. So we developed what we call the RTR system, which is radiation triage, treatment, and transport. And there are two basic sets of sites. Um, one set formed spontaneously, which was RTR 1, 2, and 3. And the other set of sites could be uh, predetermined. So the ones forming spontaneously were RTR 1, which there would be uh, radiation and, and severe physical damage, RTR2, uh, which there would be just radiation and no physical damage. And I think people were surprised that you could have that kind of a, a separation between physical and radiation damage. And that would be in the, in the major fallout zone where there could be many casualties who could be very effectively helped by a good medical care. The predetermined sites include the medical care centers, assembly centers, and evacuation centers. And since we were doing national preparedness, one has to prepare for these on a national scale. So there was much work being done behind the scenes for various scenarios for the various cities in which we felt a, this kind of nuclear incident or nu nuclear terrorism could occur. So this table shows about 15 years of work from many people. And this began um, from the background of which was the 1960s duck and cover. There was essentially no recent preparedness for nuclear detonations done. So again, a number of people worked on what we ended up calling nuclear incident medical enterprise. And the key factors here are shown in the red arrow is that everything has to be science-based. And this was a great strength of having this work done at HHS and ASPR because of the proximity to NIH and also to the coordination with CDC. So it was science-based, it requires coordination. There were then scenarios and impacts. So one plans for a various type of scenario. There were underlying health and medical concepts. Then there were planning and response resources, including concept of operations, product we called MedMap and our GeoHealth. And probably one of the most important contributions was a radiation emergency medical management system that I'll mention later that uh, Dr. Judy Bader helped create. But the purpose of all of these was shown by the green arrow number two, was to have response tools and capabilities. 
we assume that most disaster responders would not have experience or much interest in being up to date with a nuclear incident because of its rarities. So our goal was to have tools that could be available immediately. They could pick up quickly and uh, in a short amount of time be, be able to respond to an incident. So these included decision-making, communication tools, how to organize a response, how to do triage, how to do medical management, and then how to institute medical care. So we spent a lot of time working on these projects, working on these projects, realizing these are really high consequence, but very low risk events because it's a, they're gonna be very rare scenarios. And uh, again, we were happily going about our planning. And then one day we get a phone call. A crisis was happening in Japan. It was the, the earthquake and the tsunami. It was a, a disaster of uh, hundreds of miles of coastline were destroyed. Many tens of thousands of people were, were lost and died from this. And among this was a nuclear a power plant, which lost a, its power supply, and the reactors began to overheat. So it was a multiple disaster. The big problem for Japan was all the, uh, the physical injury and the flooding and all the loss of life, but the world focused a great deal on the nuclear power plant. So after a few days of discussion, a few of us were sent over to help in Japan. So the ambassador asked Nicole Lurie, who was the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, and people were discussing who should go, who should go, and she said, just get the team you need, go over there and go ahead and do this. So we flew to Japan, the airplane was, was essentially empty. The flight crew was worried about getting radiation as we were flying over the ocean. So there was clearly a lot of fear among people involved at all with Japan. When we got there, there were signs of the earthquake. There was a creaking in the hotels. You can see the damage to the walls in the hotel. The local stores had very limited stock. Tokyo, which is a bustling city, which we had been in a few times, was really very quiet. And there were, what was left on the shelf was really sort of odd, odd lot of, uh, of things to eat. It was very gray and very quiet. This is the view from our hotel over the embassy housing compound. It was a very somber time, as one might imagine. Our team was put together, and the working hours were, were very interesting, is that these are very long working days. So in Japan, one has to get up about four or five in the morning. The ambassador in, insisted that we all do some degree of exercise every day to help reduce the stress. So a day started about four o'clock in the morning and went till around 10 or 11 at night with early communications between uh, the US and Japan going on at the shift change early in the morning and late in the day. So it was about midnight for us, um, we went to sleep, but then a few hours later, we had to get up to be in contact with the US. So it ended up being very long days that were mostly 16 to 20 hour days for the first few weeks. So our team would get together in Starbucks coffee and, and we went to work. Our work was conducted at the US Embassy in Tokyo and Ambassador Ruz was the ambassador, extremely capable man whose, uh, whose leadership had a great deal to do with the success of our mission and the whole US response. So uh, Dr. Lurie said, well, put together a team that you need. So when I arrived in Japan, there weren't man many folks there I knew, and I was very uh, happy to rent it to Dan Blumenthal and a, a few other folks from the Department of Energy National Nuclear Security Agency. These are folks I had known over the years and we had done some preparedness together. So we had a, a, a number of folks from NNSA available. Anybody in the embassy who could spell science at all was recruited into working on this. So people were working very diligently and I decided I better get the team that I needed. So I put together this team of four people plus someone from the Department of Defense. So Mike Noska um, joined us from the uh, FDA. He was an expert in in radiation for food and water supply. Steve Simon, who's an expert from NCI Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics, and is an, again, an expert in radiation epidemiology. Tom Bowman came from a strategic national stockpile. We felt we may have to deliver KI or other medical countermeasures, so he came over to run that. And the one with the phone in her ear was Janet Telfer, which is our communication expert from the CDC. So she actually understood about Twitter and things like that. So we were very grateful to have her there. We had close collaborations with the Department of Defense and Michelle Hancock was our LNO, our liaison officer from DOD. 
So among the activities we did was distribution of potassium iodide. And that was very controversial because the need for KI was, was really probably not necessary. But because there was some KI being distributed to some people in the military, because a lot of the winds were going offshore to where the Navy vessels were, the thinking was, well, since KI is being given to military, why don't you give it to civilians as well? So we had a major effort to distribute potassium iodide to civilians. They were all given packages in case they needed it with the advice that take these home, but don't take them until we tell you to do so. What sort of worked in the favor in, in a great deal was the direction of the winds. So the winds were largely offshore. You can see in the map, in the map in the middle where, to, where Tokyo is, you can see it there. So a lot of the fallout that went overland was mostly going away to the northwest. So the wind direction had a good deal to do with what we, were, we had to do in response. And it ended up, and you can see on the graph on the right, that because the, the Japanese did things so well, very few people actually ended up having significant radiation exposure. And those are largely uh, limited to some of the workers in the nuclear power plants. So there was important controversy about what happened. And again, we had to realize that the US has our own guidance for what to do for nuclear power plant incidents, but we were working in a host country and they have their own guidance. So the Japanese did what was quite appropriate. They had a, a, a 10 kilometer zone around Fukushima. They had a, a, another zone about 20 miles that was say, mostly evacuation zones. But that was quite appropriate. But the US also put up a 50 mile evacuation zone because that's what we would put up to avoid exposure around the nuclear power plant incidents in the United States, just to avoid almost any risk of significant fallout. So there was really very little risk there, but by the fact that the US had a, a different size zone compared to Japan was uh, produced some consternation. And again, it shows the, the, the challenge of us doing activities um, in a host country. And what was also um, interesting was the, the different units. Of course, we use miles and they use kilometers and it was REM versus millisievert. Overall confusion in what we had to do. One of our major job was to work with the Japanese um, and we put together a health and medical working group. In the first uh, few days, the US was working unofficially, but on one Sunday, we were officially invited by Japan to work. And we put together the over this overall medical working group which I represented the US as one of the senior officials. And the topics we had to deal with were modeling, um, what people were at risk for evaluation, for toxicity, and for evacuation. What is the proper dose and schedule for potassium iodine? And messaging, how does one communicate and what to communicate? So we had the first meeting with the ministers on a Sunday and the organizing meeting on Tuesday. And when we came to the organizing meeting, they had realized that um, I had already worked with some of the leaders in Japan and we had trusted relationships. And this will go to a, a, a real important aspect of this is that these trusted subject matter expert to subject matter expert partnerships are really important in getting things done effectively. So by Tuesday, we were given our assignment for, to deal with these three major projects. And by Friday, by five days after the initial assignment, we had completed our work in both languages and had our work essentially all done for this working group. And it showed again, the power of collaboration. And I think once they saw how effectively we could work together, the, the interaction between us and our Japanese counterparts went very smoothly for the rest of the time there. So a major part of our job was to communicate. And we held at least four educational sessions, major educational sessions, some were in the Tokyo American Club, and there's a Steve Simon and I preparing to do that. And we gave a, a briefs almost daily to embassy staff. We gave some to the American Chamber of Commerce in Japan, and again, mostly to American citizens. Although, as uh, I will tell you later, a lot of our presentations ended up being taped and being broadcast as a way of getting information out uh, relatively rapidly to the public. So Liz Mike Nasca setting up the table and a key question kept coming up, is the water safe, is the water safe? One of our first days there, before my helpers got there, there was a report of some radioactive iodine in the water supply in Tokyo. And it happened that there was some rain and, and one small area picked up some uh, iodine. So there was a big to-do of what to do. Do we 
evacuate Tokyo? Do we have to worry about the whole water supply? It ended up being resolved pretty quickly when we got future samplings. But a major uh, issue for most people was, is the water safe? What do I have to worry about as a citizen in, uh, in Japan? So we had large conferences. There were 350 or more people, standing room only in almost all our sessions. And the sessions lasted many uh, three to four hours, including formal presentations and staying around to answer questions. The briefings were very sophisticated. And I think that was an essential message that we got, we got good at pretty quickly. So people had read a lot. They were very interested in some of the basic biology. So we talked about alpha particles, beta particles, what is exposure, what is contamination, what is internal and external contamination. We got into very sophisticated discussion of biology, and the people were very interested in that cells do respond to DNA damage and how they sense that, that they know how to deal with damage, they can undergo mitotic death, they can be cell survival, even that there's a concept of programmed cell death, which uh, many people found very interesting, and that the body does know how to deal with radiation. The fact that neighboring cells influence the outcome was, again, very interesting to the audience. And I think we found by getting to sophisticated levels, we developed some pretty decent confidence in what we knew what we were talking about. We also discussed the curve, and this is a, the curve to emergency responder, is where were the worker limits, where the radiation dose for acute radiation syndrome, which was about from one to four gray. And again, there were very few people anywhere close to that dose at all, which were people were happy to learn about. And we even got into the discussion of the linear no threshold What's the shape of the curve in the really low dose? So um, communicators have to really be quite sophisticated in their knowledge. Uh, Mike Noska talked about background radiation. What's natural background? We live in a sea of radiation. So what are the sort of levels what we're living in? What radiation occurs in food? So again, there was some comfort that people develop knowing that radiation is a part of their normal life. Action guides, what are the doses to try to avoid and how, again, how to deal with that. And also the concept is that you probably won't get to zero dose, but the idea is to allow it to get to as low as reasonably achievable dose. And, and the concept did come up, and I, we'll get to that later, and that one does have to balance risk of any radiation at all versus risk of shutting down because of radiation risk. And as you'll, you'll quickly infer, a lot of what we uh, experienced in Japan became quite relevant in the COVID response. So Steve Simon did a great job in discussing risk. We just talked about risk from skydiving and other things we do that we take risk all the time. And the important point we made is we never use the word safe. So there's always some risk for something that there's no line in the sand that separates safe from not safe. So we talked about terms of, of relative risk, attributable risk, and what we did is we said, okay, if our lifetime risk for cancer was 25%, the dose we had received being in Japan by the time we gave these talks was less than a tenth of a percent. So we came in with a risk of lifetime cancer of 25%, our risk was still less than 25.1%. So people began to get the idea that there is a background risk of cancer and the radiation exposure adds to that. So you have to put that in context with lifetime risk. And as we know, the lifetime risk of cancer is probably closer to 35 to 40 percent. So we were busy doing tasks, doing measurements, and I think it was very good to be useful. Bad things are happening. As I say, it's good to have something to do besides hand wringing. And our team was really very active, and it was again a very great experience. We became um, sort of close friends over the years. As things began to slow down a little bit, we actually did have time to go out. We found because we were on a government budget, places you can get a bowl of soup for three dollars as opposed to a $40 lunch, and there's the three of us having lunch, and we, uh, Steve was either doing uh, catching a fly um, or, or looking for radioactive uh, particles. We weren't sure what it was. So we came there. Um, it was a dreary time, and it was sort of um, quite astonishing what happened as we were about to leave, when the cherry blossoms in Tokyo began to blossom. And it gives one the sense of, despite there was a, the fact there was a major disaster, that there is hope, there is rebirth. And again, people began to think about while we're dealing with the disasters, we have to begin to look forward to rebirth as how we move forward and how we move on from this. So um, this is our, our group. It was Tom Bowman, Steve Simon, Mike Noska, Janet Telfer, and me. And again, I was uh, really proud to serve with these folks. I am a retired 04 from the US Public Health Service. So it, these are the times that make you very proud to be able to serve serve your country and, and, and serve others, which we were happy to be able to do. So now I'll go through some of the lessons learned. 
And as you'll see, there are things quite in common with the COVID response. And again, there's what one learns from one type of incident can easily be transferred to others. And as far as radiation incidents go, the, the, there had been um, Chernobyl, there had been other incidents in the past, and, and those were incidents in which we learned what happened sort of after the fact. And when we do exercises, they're often pre-scripted and quite artificial. So what was interesting here is there were six reactors, there were a, a lot of recycled fuel, there was a really major disaster that was unfolding and we did not know how it was going to unfold and we did not know what we would have to face. So this was really working with a great deal of uncertainty. And the way the ambassador organized much of this was having a group of us work with him, about nine of us, we would work with him twice a day, having major discussions where everybody was encouraged to take their guests and say what they think. You can be wrong, just get more information. So I think that open way that he ran things was really a great way that one learns how to run incidents. And, and Ambassador Roos did a terrific job. So I'll go through some of the lessons learned, which included communication within government and with the public, how one does decision making with limited information, the need for diagnostics and the consideration for scarce resources. How do you do just in time and up-to-date medical management for rare incidents? What is involved in operational capacity and real-time flexibility? The essential role of subject matter experts in decision-making. And black swans require preparedness. The value of seeing when preparedness is not available. So this is a global issue. So as we go forward for these sorts of incidents, when you don't know where to respond, how can you prepare in a global issue for rare incidents. And again, the bottom line of all this is all disasters are public health and medical first. So all disasters are about people first. So communication, this slide may seem funny, but it's actually true, is when you get communications from an official agency, a lot has to go through that. So those of us on the, in the incident, uh, we get some information from the incident and early data. The expert on site presents the data for reachback experts, and the reachback experts are both communication experts and scientific experts. So they'll come up with a recommendation. They may request more information before they give out the data. The data then comes back for action, and the data then comes back for communication. So even in the best of circumstances, this can take a number of hours. And when you were dealing with the uh, US and Japan and the, and the different time zones, for us with reach back to US, it could be as long as a day and a half before when we gave them information and when we could get an approved response on the way on the way out. So so we figured we had some gap we had to fill. And when there are eight agencies involved, each agency has to go through its own process, then then has to be brought to a central authority, and one has to reach consensus for from the agencies. And this may sound a bit silly, but to do things right, and you can see it with COVID, you really have to bring the experts together. So you really have to get your information done right. But while you're reaching consensus, you still have to come with some action. So what happened is this uh, golden box here is that under the guidance of the ambassador and with our communications experts, we realized we had to do two things. We had to actually do some things on partial information and we had to do communication. And the communication was, was clearly provided as this is not final, but things we have to think about. So we realized we had to do things on the fly, which we were able to then do most using social media. As we've seen in the Radiation Research Society, we've had talks on how to, how to give news. Randy Heyer has given talks. So public communications, we became trusted sources of information. I mean, one has to listen, one has to be patient, one has to be knowledgeable, and one has to get practice in doing this. And as we notice, our, our fourth public meeting will be a lot better than our first but we would stay around for hours until the last person left. Often people would not ask their questions because of embarrassment, and we stayed to the very end. And when I came back six months later, I met with some of my friends from Japan, and we said, were you happy you had subject matter experts there? They said, yeah, 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 that was important. He said, the most important thing was you were here. You were here with us, and the fact you as an expert were willing to be here with us meant it was okay for us to be here. So being there, being on the scene, not just some distance is really important to have the experts on site. So how does one make decisions? And we developed an approach called the medical decision model. So if you look at what people have to make major life-saving decisions day after day in life, it's people who do emergency medicine and people who do cancer care. So in emergency medicine, you have a history and physical, 
you have to do a medical intervention. Someone may be lying on the floor or something bad's happening. You get some laboratory data. You do some further interventions based on that. You get some more consultation. You have more complex data, you do further innovations, and then eventually you do a definitive course of management. And what happens with oncology care, it's actually quite the same. Someone will present to you, they'll often have some medical situation that can't wait to the full evaluation. So you get some laboratory diagnosis, you get some imaging, you get some consultation, you get further interventions, you get more complex data. You can finally do the definitive course of management, but you've had to make decisions based on partial information and you have to be comfortable in making decisions and partial information. And this is not something that politicians and political people are used to doing. And again, for each entity, there would have to be that kind of decision-making. So, so the same conclusion came from medical decision-making. You really need, for even major decision-making for the incident, you really need people on the scene who are comfortable being able to work with the central authority and help them make decisions that were not necessarily the final decision that had to be explained to the public, but had to be done effectively in real time. So based on our experience, a group of us put together a paper, Recover and Resilience After a Nuclear Power Plant Disaster, a medical decision model for managing an effective, timely, and balanced response. And what was important in this is you can see the list of agencies involved in this. So these are folks from different agencies, all who worked together on the spot there, and we put together this model, which we thought would be a way one would have to manage a nuclear incident in the future. And the slide is somewhat complex, but how one manages it is that one has to look at the key infrastructure and physical infrastructure, the power plant, water, food, medical countermeasures, personal issues, and so forth. And for each of these sectors, there are conditions in which condition red is that it's too dangerous to actually do anything. Um, there's a condition yellow where things are getting a little better. You can begin to go back into normal operations and, and condition green where it's okay to go back to resume normal activity. Each of these has some criteria for red, yellow, and green. For personal issues, it's, it's particularly complicated. There are some people, and you can see with COVID, who don't want to do anything that's risky at all. They want to make sure all the risk is, is gone before they resume activity. And so from folks who are willing to resume activity much sooner. So you can manage an incident in really three different ways. The first way is the most cavalier. As soon as all, all the key reds are gone, you say, okay, we can start going back to condition yellow, start moving ahead, and we can get opening and get things going quickly. And you can see, again, for COVID, some places did that, some didn't. You can say, okay, let's wait until everything is safe before we start doing so. So the condition green for the, for the general group would be much later, and you'd lose all this, this time in between where perhaps some things can, can be done. And model number three is you start back carefully and you inform people that you may have to shut down again. And again, that is being used to some extent with COVID, although it's hard to get people, as you can see, to shut down again once they've gotten going. But we thought the medical decision model was really quite a good way to manage these incidents. The other thing um, one has to deal with is scarce resources, crisis standards of care. So for most disasters, responders are used to dealing with sickest first. But when you have a crisis standards of care, you go from what's called conventional standards of care, where you, how you treat people normally, contingency, where you're beginning to run out of some supplies, but you can still swap some things in and out, to crisis standards of care, where there's not enough resources to actually take care of your sickest patients. An example of being a ruptured spleen and seven surgeons is no problem. Uh, seven ruptured spleens and one surgeon means you can't take care of the ruptured spleens. They have to be put farther back on the line. And it's what we modeled for nuclear disaster. If you did the uh, moderately injured before the most severely injured, injured, moderate first, you can save many more lives. And this requires us being able to define crisis standards of care situations and change the order of triage. So example, this would be for radiation in conventional or contingency standards, the group that would benefit most from medical countermeasures for whole body radiation would be between two and six gray. These folks below it don't need an immediate intervention for radiation injury. The higher doses you would do something about, but when you start running out of resources, when you get into crisis standards of care, the people who would initially be triaged immediately care would end up getting triage to delayed or expected. So when you change crisis standards of care, your order of triage changes. How you go about doing that, well, you have different triage. So uh, triage one would occur based on physical information for nuclear incident. 
Um, people go home, they go for medical care, or they need more diagnostics. And then you do serial diagnostics, which could be a point of care diagnostics or high throughput screening diagnostics. And what's happened a great deal in the last few years is a lot of this work for diagnostics has been done with novel approaches. And this is work being done by NIAID and BARDA to get diagnostics so you can do better initial sorting and triage of people. Uh, for medical management, as I tell people, when you if you leave this talk, the one thing you want to remember is REM. That's radiation emergency medical management. We thought that people had to be managed as we do for advanced cardiac life support, algorithmic-based management. So Dr. Bader and colleagues from the National Library of Medicine have put together REM. It's on the website, and it teaches you what an incident is about and how to go about managing it. It's really an extraordinarily useful tool, and again, it's a, it's, it's a great contribution. For the U.S., when you have to manage many people, you need uh, community folks willing to help, and we put together the Radiation Injury Treatment Network from bone marrow transplanters and hematologists and oncologists. So should an incident happen, we now have sites to move people to. And there are new paradigms that are being put together. What was published recently called CMOS, C-B-R-N-E, Chem Biological Radiologic Nuclear Explosive Medical Operation Science Support Expert. The idea that in all these steps of doing emergency preparedness and response from the basic sciences all the way through lessons learned, it's really critical to have subject matter experts who are trained both in subject matter and also operational response. And this is uh, the CMOS. And the other model we're working on is called DRUM, Dynamic Resource Utilization Management. And this is how one can manage a complicated incident by knowing where, where supplies and things are. And this is, again, something we had planned for nuclear and is being implemented to some extent through COVID. Transnational collaboration is really essential. So the Global Health Security Initiative, which is a group of the G7, IAEA, WHO, um, and the European Commission meets periodically. We have a radiologic nuclear threat working group among the other working groups. And this is a group that had been working together almost since 2005. So when the incident happened in Fukushima, we had all known each other. And the SME, subject matter expert, the subject matter expert communication among the group was really quite important in managing this. And the uh, GHSI, Rad Nuke Threat Working Group, is again working together to be prepared for these black swan events should they happen. So there's been a, a lot of work done in the last 10 years, and there's, there's many documents that have been put together. Again, if things happen, there's, again, many of the documents are available. So a good deal of work has been done. And again, we feel that these are horrible incidents, of course, but again, we are somewhat prepared, at least we're not fully unprepared, I could say, um, for an incident such as this. So what are some of the experiences from Japan? Well, this was called Operation Tomodachi, which means friendship. And the little figure on the right for me is very touching. It is what happens when people come together to help one another to solve the problem. And again, a lot of us feel very privileged to have been involved to help our colleagues in, in Japan and to help the country um, respond to this uh, multiple disaster. There was great appreciation from Japan. And again, the, the appreciation from the, uh, certainly went both ways. This is all possible because Ambassador John Roos and Suzanne Basala, who is a, his administrator. She works for the U.S.-Japan Collaborative now, and he was just an extraordinary leader. And Nikki Lurie, who supported this mission, people were saying, who should go, who should go? And Nikki said, just go and take the resources you need. And our response would not have been possible without that. Tom Sizemore, Mike Vineyard, and Kevin Yeski were the folks on the on calls whenever we had to discuss. They were also available for reach back for me and to us to begin to to send information back to U.S. So as I started with, um, all disasters are first and foremost public health and medical, and it's all about people. So as the world moves on, Japan, of course, still suffers from the consequence of this. And there's been some uh, very, very well done pieces done for the 10th anniversary, including one from the New York Times, there's no town left. And it showed a lot of what was never rebuilt in Fukushima. And here are some pictures, I asked permission to copy them from the Japanese Times of what parts of Fukushima look like now. And of those of you who've been to Japan, it's a very fastidious country where they've, uh, they take great care of, of everything. And these are sites that just have simply not recovered from the nuclear power plant. And the bottom right, areas where there's a contaminated soil that's being stored. And it'll take many, many years or decades for this incident to be cleared.
There's still a lot of damage in the nuclear power plant. I had the fortune to go there six months afterward, and the extent of destruction was really uh, astonishing, but also the extent of repair, even by six months after, how the roads had already been repaired was also quite astonishing. So there's a lot of work still done to clean up the nuclear power plant, to understand what's going to happen with all the health and medical consequences. And, and again, there's a great deal of remembrance for the many people who died during this Fukushima incident. So there's other sources of information that are available on the, to the webinars. There's one coming up from the WHO, Rempan webinar, which I uh, recommend people listening to. Jeanette Carr always puts together uh, great meetings, and she's doing one for this. So some of the conclusions are black swan incidents happen. The power of preparedness and partnership was really essential. Preparedness mattered. We spent a lot of time preparing for a nuclear incident. And what, when something happened, we were ready and we knew what to do. So without that preparedness, we would not have functioned nearly as well. For nuclear power plants, the individual sites all are required to have plans. But for something like this that happened that we did not expect it, preparedness really mattered. Nuclear radiologic incidents have a great deal of complexity and require broad engagement from expertise in sectors. So one really has to prepare at a broad scale. A preparation for a large no-notice incident addresses aspects of other hazards, threats, and disasters. I and mean, this is the benefit to the all hazards preparedness. And taking on something as complicated as a nuclear disaster really helped us prepare for other incidents. Global trusted partnerships among subject matter experts has many positive spin-offs. And as, as you see in, uh, we saw here in, in the nuclear incident, and you can see in COVID, subject matter experts, the subject matter experts are a great way of getting information exchanged and getting things done. And what we do for all our preparedness, I mean, what's the goal of subject matter expert? It's to take this very, very complex information, put it all together. And when a responder says, Doc, I appreciate all this complex information, but what do I do? And our job as preparedness and responders is to make sure they have the resources that they need to address that question, what do I do? So I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank the Radiation Research Society, uh, arigato gozaimasu for my friends in Japan. It was really a, a privilege to be part of Operation Tomodachi. I'm happy to do this for the Radiation Research Society, which does so much for radiation health. And again, I was, uh, I'm very grateful for my colleagues who were part of the mission I was part of during Fukushima and for the many folks in the embassy and U.S. who helped us do what we were able to do. So at this point, I turn it back to you, Mark, and I'm happy to answer any questions. John, that was, that was fantastic. So the Q&A is open. So one of the things that I was thinking about during this is the fact that sometimes the tsunami, which was a tremendous event, is in the shadows of the radiation event. And, and how did you weigh those opportunities? Because there was so much going on in terms of the tsunami damage and the loss of life. How did you kind of balance those when you, I know you, you knew your job, but yeah, it, it, it was very difficult because the catastrophe was really the huge loss of life. The ambassador, and we had pictures, we had a lot of uh, feedback from people who had, had been there. And, and I think the people in Japan realized that we were very sensitive to that and, uh, and that the world was focused on this nuclear power plant and we understood why, but we try to keep it in perspective. I think one of the most interesting things um, in the medical decision model is early on when I was talking about that, I said the most important thing we have to do is help Japan open up because otherwise you'll start losing your business. And they said, wait a minute, here you are as a nuclear expert worrying about our economy. They were just really uh, appreciative of how much we considered the entirety of, of what we had to face. So if you have you had the opportunity to go back more recently and and, and talk to your colleagues? Or do you talk with your colleagues, Japanese colleagues of, about this anniversary? I'm sure it's a very somber event, but. Yeah, so we've, we've been there a few times. I think you've been, you may have been in some of those as well. I also, um, yeah. Yeah, so the, so the Japanese have done, a, I mean, an incredibly fastidious job. So we, we were there, we went to Fukushima a, a few times. One of the biggest problems is, is when you get novel diagnostic approaches that you didn't have before. So because of ultrasound, they were able to diagnose tiny things in thyroid glands of kids. Yes. So, so then people became fearful. Does everybody at risk thyroid cancer? So the role for epidemiology and people could really understand and explain risk was really essential. What is the risk? What's attributable, attributable risk? The big worries now for them are still the long-term consequences of this, the really economic consequences. If you look at the impact of this incident on energy 
for the whole world. I mean, do you go to nuclear power plants or not? I think countries change their their, their energy uh, supply approaches because of this. So, so the consequences have been um, very large. And I think that, again, one of the more important thing was the, the collaboration and the collegiality, which for the US and Japan went back to the 1940s no. from RERF. And, and, I, and I think it really shows the best of what humanity can do when it works together. Works There's together. a question in the chat uh, from Amy Cronenberg about the physical dislocation has turned out to result in a lot of psychological impact in the population. In hindsight, was there anything that could have been done early to help prepare people to reduce the severity of a particular outcome? I remember this because there was the yellow passports that people were given that said they were in the area and yeah. Yeah, so a few things I've learned about uh, about evacuation, both from our own hurricanes. Remember, they had a uh, yeah. an evacuation, a bus caught on fire, and you know more people died in the bus fire than from the evacuation. So, so the way risk is now measured or assessed for evacuation is what is the risk of the incident itself, and what is the potential risk for a evacuation. So, so, so people assess that the big risk um, in many ways is people leaving and never coming back. And, and I think that's probably one of the biggest consequences why some of the, the slides I've shown, a lot of the area is probably quite reasonable to live in, yeah. but, but people who, who left it aren't going back there. And anything with the name Fukushima on it became verboten. Yeah. And uh, one call we had, there was a, a cargo ship had arrived in Italy um, with some silk from Japan, okay? And that was like four days after the reactor incident. And the question was, is it safe to now use products from Japan? So explaining risk from the environment is really, really, really tricky and it's really essential, of course. A question related to catastrophic events due to climate change, such as the loss of power in Texas. Do you feel the U.S. is in similar danger for a nuclear event like has happened in Japan due to the tsunami? Are we more prepared? That's always a tricky question. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, I think for nuclear power plants, they, they are prepared and, and, and they're in between, a, you know, a nuclear, you know, Rock in a hard place. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, you know, it's not a detonation, but it has it has the uh, it has the fallout issues. And at least in, for power plants, they take time to boil over. And what was surprisingly interesting is how much the, the people from the NRC could predict to some extent what was going to happen, what kind of energy, what was left in the reactor by sampling the air, and also how accurate weather prediction is. If people can predict weather quite accurately, and we'd ask people, are you sure the weather is going to be this way in three days, four days? And they say, yes, we are sure about that. For nuclear disasters, you know, there's still you know, some risk of, of, of nuclear detonation. There's a thing called the Planning Guidance for Response for Nuclear Detonation, which was done in 10, 2012, and a new version is coming out now. And it's gone much beyond the 10 KT incident. It now considers state-sponsored incidents, like 100 kiloton air bursts. And people say, well, it's horrifying. How can you talk about that? But these things are considered. There's a, a lot of great work done by Lawrence uh, Livermore Lab, by Department of Homeland Security, in trying to prepare for these these larger size incidents. And I, I think the robustness of infrastructure, you, you, you learn from the, the Texas thing how, how fragile it can be. So preparedness is good and it's not so good when you don't do it, as you can see. Yeah, I agree. A question related to the you know, power preparedness partnership and more importantly, trust for Black Swan incidents. And, and you know, trust seemed to be missing with, with Black Swan at the Wuhan COVID-19 situation. I don't want you to put on your government hat. I just thought, you know, how did that get out of control? Because it seemed to. Well, it's a whole idea. You have to, you have to be truthful, and you don't always know the truth, but you have to be truthful. It was interesting how people were comfortable with this is what I know. That's why being able to really explain to people the basics, they say, "You guys know what you're talking about." So when you said, "I don't know," they were quite comfortable with that. One of the great phrases I came up with is, "My job is to be a designated warrior." Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, we're gonna we're gonna communicate twice a day. If anything comes up, we, we're gonna communicate. So you don't have to stay on your radio. You could we'll communicate to you. And I think that they got that kind of uh, a confidence in Japan too. They hadn't prepared for this. I don't think anybody had. And you know, what was really going on? Some things Tepco just didn't know. It was non-knowable. So it was somebody obfuscating. I, I think getting out front um, and telling the truth and being truthful is the way you have to do that. And you need people who know what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, and again, there are communicators who communicate, and there are a bunch of us, you know, scientists who are 
who are nerds. And there was a lot of a lot of power in being a nerd on the spot. It gets you a lot of credibility and people sort of get a kick out of, you know, you've got you guys a bunch of nerds and <laughs> it goes over surprisingly well how much we're trusted. And our trusted networks really matter. And we have that now for Rad Nuke, um, through IAEA, for Global Health. If something happens, we're in communication with each other very quickly. There was a question about diagnosis and the need for diagnostics. What tool do you wish you had that was not available to you during the response of Fukushima? Well, it would, probably wasn't such a much, so much a problem there because not that many, that many people were impacted, but you want to be able to know dose. I mean, you can't, you can't treat when you can't diagnose. Yeah. So the sooner you could know dose, the better. And the dicentric chromosome assay takes a while to get that. You know, lymphocyte counts are useful, but also take a bit. So I think a lot of the work now in molecular diagnostics, PCR is a common word now in, in, the, in the language, but to have something you can take a, a sample, run it on a little assay and say, you can go home, you have to go to the next stop. To be able to triage people accurately would be really very helpful. So biomarkers for any kind of disease, for COVID, for nuclear, for anything is really, really essential. And I think one thing we're gonna get from COVID is the whole world of biomarkers. Yeah, yeah, and I, there's another question related to that is, you know, the cytogenetics is, is, is getting better, but it's still not fast, but there are people working on this. Like you said, a very straightforward yeah. PCR test to help do it quickly in a handheld device, probably. Mm -hmm. You really <laughs> talked about the, the role of the system being overwhelmed by people that weren't really exposed to the radiation event. And what do you do with people that have not really been exposed, but are clearly thinking they yeah. have? Well, again, it was trusted communication. So, and again, a, a nuclear thing, the, the bad thing is that you can measure it. And the good thing is that you can measure it. Yeah. Um, some people who knew what their exposure was and the way we presented the risk from various exposure. If you're in this area, you've gotten very little to none at all. So, so I think by being able to give people information about where they were, what their potential risks were, uh, really helped. I think by being there, that was the most interesting thing, instructive line I got when I came back. Your, your expertise was great, yeah, blah, blah, blah. The fact that we were there, we were there with them and we didn't yeah. leave meant such a, made such a difference to them. It sort of calmed this place down. Even within hours of us getting there, they felt a lot better. These guys are, girls are hanging out with us. We kind of talked about this, kind of the relative weights of the tsunami and the tremendous the, you know, disaster from that versus you're talking about what the, what the radiation concerns are and how you weighed that. I mean, I'm sure the ambassador had and other people on the ground we're concerned about these things, but we were obsessed in the West with radiation. So. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So we, so we had to communicate the best we could, and we had great, you know, great experts. The Department of Energy, we had people who could measure. The, the Navy was great. We would, in part of our meetings, we would have two star would be serving coffee because there were so many three and four stars meeting with us. <laughs> um, I'm being a little facetious, but the, the, the Navy was so good. These people are so competent. So we got together, we, we disagreed, we'd settle things. So I think the ability to communicate, to, to put things in perspective was, was spectacular. The Navy was just wonderful in helping with the disaster itself, but also in helping manage uh, the radiation because they had ships, they were getting measurements offshore so we could yeah. put together scenarios. And the last question, I know we're a little bit over time, is uh, uh, from my friend Joe Denlock. How do you handle the problem of the stigma of being associated with being irradiated? And also, you know, the overreaction to the uh, concern with contamination of animals and foodstuffs and produce? Yeah, I mean, it's a, I don't know how you handle it. You can be as truthful as you can be. I think it's, it's risk communication. And I think it's a complicated concept, but not really. I think the attributable risk really made a difference. This is, yes, you got some risk for this. You have a 38% chance of getting cancer. If they're sitting here, it's 38.01. And people would say, oh, yeah, that's okay. So, so I think being able to describe it that way. And something about dicentric, that people who have any any measurements that at all can be worrisome, you could then do the dicentric. If you got it two months later, it's really more for risk communication uh, and getting epidemiologists involved and uh, getting getting scientists who can communicate, scientists who can listen. I think listening, listening and being patient. Wonderful. I, so I, I think we'll stop. There. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you very much. And I'll hand it over to Cassandra to close us out. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. That was wonderful. A lot of great questions answered too. Stay tuned next week. We'll send you the recording of this webinar. And thank you again. Everyone have a great night.
Thank you. Cheers, everybody. Thank you. Cheers.